In this video, I'd like to approach William Wordsworth's poem, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, from the perspective of aesthetics. And we're doing a series on this poem, and in the next bunch of videos, we're really going to look at different theoretical perspectives that might help us make some sense of the poem. Aesthetics is the, the study of beauty, or taste, so the study of beauty. And there are really two ways to kind of talk about this. You can talk about particular tastes. So for instance, I like something or, and, and you might not. Um, but we can also talk about the poem itself as dealing or di um, engaging directly with this topic. In other words, the second approach is less about whether I like the poem or you do, and is more about what the poem itself has to say about aesthetics or the study of beauty. Now, one key question in this field is, is there a difference between what is beautiful and what is sublime? And by sublime, we mean something that causes awe, right? That leaves you spellbound, that leaves you amazed. Uh, and the sublime is typically also quite epic in character. If you look at these two pictures here, for instance, which one do you think is more sublime and which one is more beautiful? Well, I think you'd probably say that the mountains are more sublime and the iris, the flower, is more beautiful. A little bit of subjectivity there, perhaps, but as we go on, I think you'll see that this distinction uh, would probably hold up fairly well. Okay, so as Wordsworth is writing his piece in 1804, uh, he is quite influenced by some significant works on this topic. And the first of these is from the first century AD, Longinus on the Sublime. Um, it's a sort of foundational work. It's a bit fragmented. It's not entirely complete, but it has a lot of interesting things to say about what actually causes the sublime and how we might define it. The next two works are more recent, and these are both from the 18th century, 1757 and 1764. And you'll note that Edmund Burke and Immanuel Kant both refer to this distinction between the sublime and the beautiful, or the beautiful and the sublime. It's a distinction that Burke makes very much. Uh, he really draws this out. And even though Kant is critical of Burke, because he's not philosophical enough in his analysis, uh, he does take up the same distinction, and he tries to kind of sharpen it a little bit. So the distinction then is that the sublime is quite different from the beautiful, and it's one. It's a distinction you will not find to the same extent in Longinus, uh, who doesn't create as sharp a contrast. To zoom in a little bit to Edmund Burke, Edmund Burke defines the sublime as follows, and this is from the Harvard Classical Edition. Whatever is fitted in any sort to excite the ideas of pain and danger, that is to say, whatever is in any sort terrible or is conversant about terrible objects, and we would say terrifying, right, not terrible, or operates in a manner analogous to terror, is a source of the sublime. That is, it is productive of the strongest emotion which the mind is capable of feeling. This is a really influential passage because what Burke is basically saying is that there is an aspect of the sublime that involves terror. And you can sort of imagine that if you're in the mountains, you're standing at the edge of a cliff, and you see this, this sublime landscape, there is a bit of terror because you feel small, you might fall off, and there's danger involved. Uh, something similar happens when you look at the night sky and you see the stars, right? You see stars everywhere. You feel tiny. And again, the danger is there because you tend to shrink in relation to the universe and it makes you think about your death. That's terror. That's sublime. So it's terror, but it's not the kind of terror that just totally frightens you. This is not like a Stephen King novel, right? Uh, this is a terror that's pleasurable. And you can see the reference to pleasure here. So that's Burke's contribution to this, although when Wordsworth himself wrote an essay in 1811 discussing the beautiful and the sublime, he said that there is a kind of sublime moment that does not involve terror. So he didn't feel that terror was an absolute prerequisite. And in the poem, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, of course, there is not that much terror. There's a little bit, perhaps, but, but very, very little. Okay, so that's the sublime then, very broadly speaking. And when it comes to the sublime, there's always the same questions that come up again and again in all of these theoretical works. 
One of the big questions is, is the sublime something that is an active or a passive experience? Is it active or passive? Does it happen to you uh, or is it something that's more perhaps self-conscious and, and something you can create? Longinus famously compared the, the sublime to a thunderbolt, right? It's something that just hits you out of the blue and you're, you're reading something and uh, you go, wow, that was a sublime passage. And, and you don't even see it coming. You're just overwhelmed by emotion. The question then is, does self-consciousness destroy the sublime feeling? Right? Is self-consciousness bad in this respect? Because as soon as you're aware of something, you go, well, you know, that's, I guess I'm experiencing the sublime. <laughs> and maybe that self-consciousness detracts from that moment. So that, that's an th uh, important theoretical question. Another important question that the Romantics asked was, is the sublime something that's in the object itself or in the mind? In other words, is a mountain always going to be sublime, no matter who sees it? Or is it a subjective experience where I might find something sublime that you don't, right? And that, again, is an important theoretical question. And the last major question is about subjectivity, then. Is the sublime something that is really dependent on who is actually watching? And Kant spell, spent quite a bit of time actually thinking about this. He even talked about it in terms of gender. Uh, is the sublime something that w men experience more than women, as Kant seemed to feel? Uh, and this became an important discussion point during the Romantic period. Uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, for instance, the, the English writer, uh, said what men find difficult is sublime women. When they see a woman who is not merely beautiful but has intellect, who um, is smart, right? That scares people. There's that element of terror. So smart women cause terror, and they are sublime. And maybe that's a good thing, but men are still too scared to admit it. So a really interesting application of this, this question of, of the sublime. But we can also ask, is the sublime a national characteristic, that English people have a different sense of the sublime than, than Italians, for instance? Uh, does it have to do with temperament? So if I have a particular kind of mood or temperament, is that going to set me apart? A lot of theoretical questions about the sublime were being asked at this point. Another term that we can probably bring up here to distinguish it from the sublime is the term bathos. And bathos is the term for the opposite of the sublime. So if you have something really epic and then you have this kind of anticlimax that brings us down to the trivial, then we call this movement bathos. Okay? And the word bathos comes from Greek for depth. So it's this notion that you, you're at this epic level and then you, you go down to the depths. Um, just a couple of examples here. If you watch Star Wars and you think of like Jar Jar Binks, that would be an example of bathos because it's an epic movie and then you have this kind of trivial and ridiculous character. Um, another example would be if you're watching The Lord of the Rings and then there's that scene where Legolas is like going down on a shield on a, a staircase and he's shooting arrows at the same time. You can look it up on YouTube if you like uh, and see people even loop it because they find it so funny. But you know that's a moment of bathos because it seems so comical in relation to the epic scene. And one of the questions then is is this poem about daffodils, is it an example of the sublime? Is it an example of beauty? Or does it end up as bathos? Okay, because some of the earlier earlier readers actually did feel that I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud is an example of bathos. Uh, that's exactly what Coleridge said about it. Uh, because they said, well, this is supposed to be about daffodils, but they can't be sublime. They're just a bunch of flowers. Uh, surely Wordsworth is making too much of them. So the last thing we'll do here is we'll go very quickly through the poem and point out some things that, that make this sublime, or at least an attempt at the sublime. If you look at the opening stanza here, most of this has to do more with beauty. So this has to do more with beauty. Uh, you know, there are lots of daffodils, uh, there's a crowd of them, they're fluttering and dancing. At, at this point, I think we would not say that this is really epic. But the next stanza changes the scope. And you can see here that we zoom way out. So continuous as the stars, 
Now that is more epic, right? Um, the other part of this is the reference to 10,000 sigh at a glance, never ending line. Edmund Burke points out that one of the things that causes the sublime is some kind of contact with the concept of infinity. So as human beings, we're somewhat terrified by infinity because it's something our mind cannot grasp. And that creates terror, right? Same thing with the stars, as I mentioned before. Uh, the stars, the, the, the universe is so vast that it makes us feel small. And there is an element of terror here. And I think you can probably associate that with the loneliness as well, because being scared, being by yourself can make, make you quite scared too. Now, I did say before that there's not a ton of terror here. This is not the predominant emotion, but it's a little bit in the background. And the sense of scope in all of this makes this quite sublime. Another thing you'll notice here is this notion of competition. So the waves beside them dance, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. And this competition element makes it sublime as well. If you think about classical epics like Homer's Odyssey uh, or the Iliad, right? Those are sublime works and they have to do with, with human competition. But even in nature, we seem to find this kind of epic struggle. Um, now, again, maybe we're exaggerating a little bit, but I think you can see that there is some tension here and something that in introduces a, a more sublime topic. And then the last aspect of the poem that makes it sublime is the mind itself. So as mentioned before, one of the theoretical questions that we had is this notion of where where is the sublime found? Is it found in nature or in the mind? And the last stanza really zooms into this question. Um, the inward eye, the imagination, recreates the sublime through memory. Uh, it comes back to us, and then it gives us, us this kind of incredible pleasure right? that makes us live and dance with the daffodils. So the sublime is experienced again and again, and this is not just about beauty, but it's also about a, a passionate feeling that overpowers you uh, and that causes a kind of surprise, right? They flash upon that inward eye. So we see quite a few references to the sublime as well as the beautiful, and I think it's for you to kind of decide then whether you think the poem succeeds, does it create um, the sublime, or do you find it an example of bathos, or, and this is another possibility, and none of these possibilities are mutually exclusive, um, or is this a theoretical look at the sublime? Is, is Wordsworth really kind of interested in the question itself and trying to draw our attention to some of these theoretical questions that we've talked about?